Welcome back to Master the Marketplace with eTales. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Master the Marketplace. I've got a couple of special guests with me today. Farah as Alexander and David Malka, the Chief Marketing and Communications Officer and Chief Sales Officer of Go TRG, respectively. So very excited to have you folks on the show. Thank you. Thank now. you for having us. Now, I am not going to be able to do justice to all the work that you've done and what your company does. So let me start with you, Farah. Maybe tell our listeners, our viewers, a little bit about yourself, your career, your background. We'd just love to love more. And then, David, I'll come to you. Uh, sure. So uh, before joining GoTRG, I actually started my own returns business. It was a consumer facing app called Return Runners, uh, where you could schedule a pickup. Someone would come to your house, a white glove service, um, pick up your uh, items that you needed to return and take them back to the store for you. And that was really my first introduction to sort of this reverse supply chain and really opened my eyes to this whole world of returns that really every consumer contributes towards. But most of us have no idea what happens to that item once we drop it back off at the store. And so a couple years into my journey starting my business, I got connected with GoTRG. Uh, they ended up investing and in eventually acquiring my company. And now I oversee branding marketing and communications for GoTRG and really our mission is to transform the world of returns for retailers and manufacturers to take returns and make it a profitable uh, business opportunity for these retailers who are struggling as the return volume continues to increase and also prevent these items from unnecessarily ending up in a landfill and giving them a second life by reselling them on secondary marketplaces. So that's a little bit about my background and what we do. That's great. David, what about you? So what about me? Um, so I grew up in Canada. Um, interesting. Uh, the reason why I mentioned it was because, I mean, I loved e-commerce from the day that it started, right? I started buying on eBay, I believe, in 97. Um, and you could, as you can imagine, it was hard to buy from Canada, buy product from the U.S. It wasn't, you know, the marketplaces or e-commerce like you know it today. You know, you had to make a purchase, you had to send, you know, a money order, and it was it was really complicated. So I grew up in Canada. Um, my career shifted once I finished uh, college and university. I got into the cell phone business, uh, smartphone uh, business. And then it's funny because I did a shift in my career and I ended up in the jewelry business. Um, I ran and operated uh, and owned two jewelry stores in Montreal, Canada. And all while trying to sell online, I even tried to sell jewelry online. Obviously, it was, you know, it wasn't as easy as as it is today. Um, and then I decided that jewelry wasn't for me. Uh, and I went back into the cell phone business and um, started doing import and export between Canada and the U.S. Uh, I also um, launched a, a unlocking uh, servicing website. It was the first one to be able to unlock and service BlackBerry phones online. So it was, you know, it was a nice uh, project that I had worked on. And then I decided that, you know, Montreal was too cold for me. Uh, most of my business was coming out of Miami from the, you know, the port and Doral. So I decided it was time to move. Um, I moved to Miami, continued my cell phone wholesale business. Um, and then I had an opportunity to sell the business, uh, which I did. And that's when I joined uh, GoTRG. And uh, when I joined GoTRG, you know, we were, you know, the business had experience in the returns, the reverse logistics, but we were um, kind of uh, premature and early in the e-commerce days and omni-channel. Uh, so right at that time when I joined, that's when we uh, we decided to go full force on e-commerce, and uh, it's been quite a ride. So that's awesome. So I've got to ask you, and I typically ask people this: is what excites you about the e-commerce space, or what got you started on this e-commerce space? What was that spark, if at all? I mean, to me, it was interesting. Look, the first item that I bought, it's funny enough, the first item that I bought on eBay was a Sony Mavica floppy disk camera. And it was not available in Canada, right? So it, it was like, for me, it was like, okay, it gives me the opportunity to buy something that's not available here. And today, what excites me, you know, is, is almost the same, is instead of having to go into a store, trying to look for the items, wait in line, have the size, not the size, you have the opportunity to do this, you know, from the comfort of your home on a screen. You could see all the different models. It's also easy to, you know, to compare. 
if you're looking to buy you know a computer it's easy to compare online you can read reviews you can look at what people say you have time to do your um, your exercise and, and your in your your study before buying something unlike when you buy something you know in store you're, you're going to buy whatever's in the store you don't have that time you don't have that luxury so to me it was always fascinating because I mean, why do you need to go through all that trouble, you know, to go to local stores when you could do this online and have it delivered at your house? And if it doesn't fit or you don't like it, you can always return it and, you know, next. That's right. That's right. What about you, Farah? What was your spark? What was my spark? I think similarly to David, I think, you know, the, the world is changing. And the reason that I set out to build my business originally was because we're so busy and our familial obligations are so much greater than any other point in history where everything else, our careers, our families are demanding our time. And so if there's a way that we can leverage or leverage uh, technology to outsource these everyday mundane chores and tasks, why wouldn't we do that? If I could buy something online in the span of two minutes, instead of having to go to a store and have the transportation time, the checkout time, everything else, that's time that I could be with my son, that's time that I could be working on building my business. And so for me, it's always, you know, a, a time value proposition of money and, and by in my productivity. And I think, uh, you know, the ease and simplicity of being able to do that, especially just given the way the world is, it has currently been for the past couple of months, um, I'm really grateful for that and trying to, you know, lean into that um, as much as it, it's, it changes the way that we had been doing things for a really long time. And that sometimes can be a little bit scary too, but um, I think there's a lot of uh, positives to come out of, you know, this, this sort of shift to digital and e-commerce as well. That's Absolutely. What well, thank you both for that introduction. So today we want to talk a little more about just building your brand online, especially in this situation where you know this COVID situation has hit. It's a different game for e-commerce altogether. I know for us personally, retail is getting into the year. We didn't expect, you know, the sales to be the way they were, the situation with supply chain to be as it is, and just you know, it's it's a different game. So really, the big picture question, maybe for both of you, is if I'm a brand trying to launch online in this year, 2020, maybe going into 21. How would I have to think about the world differently now? You know, how should I even start strategizing around building my brand online? What would that look like? David, yeah, I'll, I'll start. I'll start. So obviously, I mean, you know, I've always said it even before COVID. Uh, any business that did not have a presence online was obviously missing out. Right. Um, what happened now with COVID obviously reinforced that statement. And a lot of businesses realized that, you know what? Um, they were not able to keep their stores open and, and some of them had to close, right? Because they didn't have any sales at all. I mean, I have friends personally that had, you know, stores and did not have, a, you know, an online presence. And, you know, when we would talk about it and obviously I would always bring up, you know, online sales. It was always the excuse we don't have time or the cost or the profit or the shipping. And it's like, to me, all those were excuses. So obviously today they realize that you have to have an online mm -hmm. presence and i think it's important for any brand any anybody that sells any product whether it's um, a physical product or a service has to have an online presence and needs to be able to conduct business online right so we've seen it obviously with covid now the only businesses that were able to to stay alive and and, and benefit if you want of this this whole madness were the ones that had um you know, online sites, online websites, e-commerce websites, people that were selling on marketplaces. Um, it's not it's not a luxury anymore. And I think as we go, uh, more and more people, because they had no choice now to, to, to do their shopping online, people got, are getting used to shopping online more than ever. And they realize, again, back to what I said, what's the point of going to a mall or a brick and mortar store, unless it's to do your groceries, but even groceries, you could do them on, you know, Instacart or you could do them on on any other of these uh, online um, uh, shopping sites. So any brand today that doesn't have a website or an e-commerce platform obviously is missing out. And now is the time. It's not too late, right? Uh, even if you missed, you know, the, the first part of this, you know, this this uh, craziness, I mean, it's still time to have your, uh, your business online and be able to conduct business online and make sure that, you know, your operations are not shut down. And would you recommend that that should be your first channel of choice? 
or you should start digital first and then maybe expand? Like, what would be your strategy if you were a completely new brand? Should I start online first? I would, if I were a new brand, yes, definitely. The first thing I would do is, you know, first thing is, and that's why, I mean, a lot of people want to focus only on their website and say, oh, I only want to have my own website. Obviously, you have to have your own e-commerce website because you're building a brand, you're building your name, and that's how people are going to recognize you and people are going to, you know, start shopping from you and send you traffic. So definitely any any site, whether it's a store, any business, whether it's a store, whether they sell running shoes, bikes, uh, you know, clothing, uh, pens, whatever you want, there's no reason why you can't sell online, right? It's so easy today to sell online. That's a start. Now, if you really invest the time and partner with the right company to be able to manage your online sales, then, you know, in a lot of cases, a lot of businesses that we know, their online sales uh, represent almost, almost five, six times what they sell in their brick and mortar store, right? So you have that inventory. Instead of having it only available to local shoppers, why wouldn't you have it available to everybody across the world? Anybody can buy 24-7, right? It's just, it, it's, it's common sense. So definitely any business today that does sell product, I would recommend to, it, it's a must. It's not even, you know, it's, it should be the, the first check on the list. Okay, we have our e-commerce website set up, good. If not, then uh, it's, you, you shouldn't even be in commerce. Right, <laughs> I know. That's, that's how I, I see it. <laughs> well, that's a good point. And to deep dive a little more on that. So, you know, of course, you can sell in various ways online. You can sell through your own website. You have all these different marketplaces now. So how would you think about a strategy around that? Would you go broad across all these different channels? Would you start maybe, say, on Amazon and then move to others? What would be the strategy around just selling online itself? So it, it, it all depends to how you start, right? If you start with a company like us, like GoTRG, uh, it's easy for us to put you on the map overnight across all the marketplaces, right? So I take that same product and simultaneously we can list it on all the marketplaces, which we call, you know, what we call omni-channel or multi-channel, however you want to call it. So it's easy for us to do that. There's no effort required. It's just that, you know, uh, pushing that inventory to all the marketplaces. Now, if you're a business that is just starting and you are going, you know, in a house or solo, Obviously, you're going to have to start somewhere. So I always recommend to start your own brand. That's a must, right? You have to have your own brand. And then start with a popular marketplace like an eBay, an Amazon, you know, a Walmart. And the reason for that is because, you know, let's say for us, our brand, you know, one of our retail brands is, you know, the store.com or VIP outlet. So we have our website, but we also have our eBay account that goes by that name. So any sales that are generated through that marketplace Ultimately, when the customer, you know, it's easy today, most of the people that are, you know, that are shopping online, they see something on eBay or Amazon, they see the seller name, the first thing they do is they Google that name to see any reviews. Then if they see reviews, they end up on your website. Well, guess what, if they make the purchase on your website of that same item, you're not paying the marketplace that uh, that commission or that fee that they charge you. So you just got free advertising um, for that product. So definitely recommend if you're going solo to start with your website and a popular marketplace. If you go with a solution like us, well, obviously you can go all the marketplaces at the same time and there's no reason not to do so, right? There's strategies to, to do that. It's not just push 100% of your inventory to all the marketplaces and call it a day. There's ways to do it. There's quantities, there's pricing differences. There's a lot of different strategies and techniques um, that we can help and, and which is our expertise and what we do. That's great, that's great. And maybe a fairer question for you, just to piggyback of what, what David was saying, is, you know, to run any e-commerce operation, you've got all these different pieces. Of course, selling online is one piece of it, but then you've got to manage your back office, your logistics, supply chain, warehousing, returns, all the stuff that you mentioned. So, you know, some people might get inundated with some of that. So maybe explain, you know, is that an outsourced process very easily to services like GoTRG? Uh, you know, how would that work for someone who's starting out? Yeah, I mean, obviously, as a third party service provider, we're always going to advocate to find a trusted relationship uh, that whose whose core competence competencies focus on something outside of maybe, you know, what you might have the resources to do. But I think, you know, the reality is whether it's just the trend of uh, e-commerce or COVID lately or whatever, a lot of retailers are really like just struggling for survival right now. 
They don't have the resources to dedicate to returns, but they can't ignore the reverse side of their business. So I think, you know, we love to say like a partnership with someone that is an expert in an area that isn't your sweet spot might be advantageous for you because for us, it's like we can help these retailers build brand loyalty with their customers, which is what they really want. They want recurring customers. They want their customers to be happy. They want them to be evangelists of their brand. So by them being able to outsource their returns processes to a company like us, they can free up their staff in the back rooms of these stores. They can focus on building the relationship with their customers. They don't have to deal with the headache not to mention all of the other things going on in the retail industry that are really challenging to them right now. I would just, you know, say to find someone who's truly as invested in it, in, in, as an equal partner where the, uh, the upside is, you know, equal and, and measurable and where someone really is, you know, has the, has the ability to move, move the needle for your business. And I would just be, careful and selective about who, you know, what those partnerships look like. But I think, you know, I, I don't, we would certainly be ones to advocate for, uh, for outsourcing certain projects and tasks that might be outside of your core scope of, of what your business really wants to focus on. Now, a lot of brands might feel that that could be an expensive proposition, you know, working with a large firm like yours, or is that true? Is it not? You know, how, how, how does a how does a brand quantify that? How do they make that decision? So, yeah, well, that's, sorry. Yeah, I just, that's why I said to make sure that you're aligned in what your business objectives are, because a lot of our success is tied to what we're able to resell our clients merchandise for online. And so we want to make sure that all of our technology, our pricing algorithms, everything, we're capturing the highest recovery for these items that we can on any given marketplace. And while, Yes, taking a broad uh, approach to getting more exposure on these items uh, is, is definitely a great strategy that David mentioned. We also want to close the sale on the marketplace that's, you know, that's going to sell that item for the highest price. So we have all of this back end in place to be able to do that. And I think that's, you know, when I'm when I'm talking about the alignment and making sure that there's mutual upside, I think that's the thing that you just have to be mindful of. And David, maybe you have a different take on that too. Yeah. And I, I mean, for me, I compare it. Uh course you know giving it to a third party like us and i'm not saying that because we you know that's what we do but giving it to a third party obviously the cost is going to be in the client's uh, advantage in the you know i compare it to a kitchen you know you can open you know you want to make food you can open your own kitchen you need to have you know your chefs you need to have your your ovens your you know all the all the stuff to cook it's going to cost you more money than you if you outsource it to a kitchen that's already open and they're just you know, cooking the food for you. They're already cooking. So we're already handling e-commerce. We're already handling returns. So for us, it's just that flow of the product that comes in for that client. Now, one thing also that's important to touch on this and a little bit the question before this is when any brand chooses a partner, again, they have to be aligned, right? So you have to be aligned with what you want to accomplish. So give me an example. If a brand just wants to sell online at a set price, and they want to fulfill the orders and they want to handle the returns, then they can go with a, you know, a third party provider that all they do is put their product online on these marketplaces and that's all they do. Now, if you go with a company, let's say in our case, we offer it, we call it a la carte. So we give the option to the, to the, to the brand, well, you can ship from your warehouse and then we handle the return or you can ship from your warehouse and you handle the return. You can ship to us and then we fulfill the order and the returns come back to us. You can own your own customer service or we can be uh, your customer service, customer success team, which means that we represent that brand. So depending on what the brand wants, if they want to sell under their brand, we can do that. If they want to sell you know, anonymously under some third party brand that nobody knows that can tie back to them, we could do it as well. You know, If they don't know how to price their inventory, that's where we help as well. So there's a lot of, when you choose a partner, you have to understand exactly what you want and you have to make sure that that partner is able to deliver on every single one of these goals. Because once you start with that partner, it's very hard to get out of it just because 
you know, you start building your channel and now it's like the whole logistic changes. So what I recommend to brands is do your homework and make sure that the partner that you choose is able to cover and encompass all these goals and all these uh, uh, KPIs that you want to meet and meet your, you know, your, your strategy uh, before you even start pushing your brand online and your products online. Right. So that's interesting what you said is, you know, so alignment around goals for, for a partner. So what else should a brand look for besides, you know, close alignment to maybe goals? What are, do you have a, another a few things that you could outline for us that brand should be looking for when choosing a partner? I mean, number one that comes to us, uh, one of the number ones is brand protection, right? So we want to make sure when we sell the product on behalf of a brand that we protect that brand as much as we can, right? So not only do we sell the brand online, but we also police or monitor if there's any other sellers online that are selling that brand below the map pricing or that are representing the brand, you know, incorrectly. So brand protection is important. And you have also pricing strategy, right? People think today that online, uh, the, the strategy is you have to have the lowest price. It's not true. Right. You can have the lowest price if people don't come to your your page, your landing page, your 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 product listing it doesn't change anything. Right. You can have the, the, the best item in the best store. If you have no traffic in your store, your item is not going to sell. So pricing strategy is important. We help brands uh, control the pricing and tell them, OK, you know, with the technology that we have, we dynamically price the items. And again, it comes back to the goal of the brand. Right. So if we list on different marketplaces, the price could be the same across all marketplaces, or we can list at a higher price, lower price, depending on the fees. Um, you allocate inventory, you know, or handicap one marketplace over the other. So these are all things that brands have to be aware and and have a partner that's able to do that, right? There's a lot of tools, you know, it's funny, I had a call last week, we were talking about repricing. There's a lot of tools out there that, that do repricing, right? And basically what they do is you go online and you, do, you, you know, you sign up with them, you answer a few questions and then you take, you know, your number one SKU. Let's say you say, OK, an iPhone and you say, well, this is my cost price. This is my lowest price I can sell it at. And this is the lowest price. Uh, I always want to be the lowest person online. So what happens is that if your competitor is using a repricer tool similar to yours, they lower a dollar, you lower a dollar. They lower a dollar, you lower a dollar. It's a race to the bottom, which is madness. It's insane. Our technology, to give you an example, is we also look at the weight of the product. When I say the weight, I don't mean the physical weight of the product. I mean, if I have, let's say, AirPods, right, and we're priced, let's say, at 129 and we have, you know, 2,000 units of these AirPods, and then some other seller comes online and decides to, you know, undercut me by $10, one, if I use a repricer, I'm going to drop my price $10, which I don't want to do. I have 2,000 units. Why am I going to give up $20,000 of, of revenue right. just because some guy with five or 10 pieces came online? So our technology weighs, when I say weighs, sees how much quantity that seller has. If he only has five or six, then it doesn't even consider him as a competitor. Let him sell out his five, 10 units. Keep your price up. So we're always making sure that we get the highest recovery for the product and and for that, brands need to understand that, again, it comes back to protecting the brand, the pricing, and it's not a race to the bottom. It's let's sell your product on the best channels at the highest recovery, and then also be able to stand behind the customer service, be able to stand behind the returns, be able to assist the customers. Today, online selling is not just put it online and you know, you're good to go. You have to offer returns. If you don't offer returns, That's then true. nobody's going to buy from you. Yeah. It's, so you have to be able to really, any brand that wants to go online, and when I say you want to go online and scale your business and make it really an important business, you have to be able to have your strategy aligned for all of these, um, these module components, if you want. Absolutely. And it's a complete customer experience, right? It's not only at the time of the sale, it's that experience beyond the sale to get these repeated customers coming in every time and build that relationship with the customer. I completely agree. So maybe fair a question for you related to what David said. What's your view on just, you know, monitoring the channel for unauthorized sellers and, you know, these other players or actors on marketplace, especially who are trying to get access to product illegally or, you know, how do you or maybe even maybe even walk me through how GoTRG would try to help manage that channel for for your brands? Uh, I think David's probably actually better positioned to answer that question. 
Um, David, do you want to talk about? Yes, the I'll, I'll modern... take it. So we, yes, I'll take it. So we actually, uh, GoTRG owns a piece of a company that does um, <laughs> online uh, police, I call it. Um, you know, so basically when we represent a brand, again, for us, it's important to see on that brand and have that open communication and say, okay, who are the resellers that are currently selling your products online? Is there any map pricing? Um, and then, you know, it, it's a matter of us being able to make sure that nobody else is, you know, uh, hindering the brand or, or, or causing any problems for that brand, right? When we represent a brand, we represent it like it's our own, even better than it's our own because we stand behind it, but also we don't want it to affect our sales. So it's important to look at, you know, where are the products coming from? Are they legitimate products? If they're not, if they're, you know, uh, copies or fakes, you know, we have systems in place to report them to the marketplaces, shut down the listings. If they're using, you know, copyright images, they're not supposed to, uh, you know, stock images, they're not supposed to unless they're authorized by the, uh, by the brand itself. I mean, we fall uh, under that uh, uh, kind of, you know, policing as well every day because we sell brands on behalf of the retailers, right? And sometimes, you know, the brand itself hire other companies to police their brands. And then we get letters saying, hey, you're not allowed to sell that product. We don't know who you are. We don't know who VIP Outlet or the store is. Right. Obviously, you know, we, 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 we communicate with them and explain who we are, what we do, and then they understand. But at the end of the day, the brand has to understand. You know, a lot of brands, they just want to brush away their returns problem and say, you know what, we're just going to sell our returns in bulk buy the pallet, and then and then they want to police who sells that product. You can't do that, right? The, your product's going to end up online anyways, whether you right. you you manage, you know, uh, you, you sell it through a partner that will manage your brand or not. So might as well do it through a partner that's going to manage your brand and also be your brand authority um, in order to, to, to keep your brand, you know, high standards. Yeah. One of the things that, you know, I, and I worked at Amazon, so, you know, I have a little experience here. When I was at Amazon and we would work with a lot of brands, some brands would try to have this segmentation strategy. So they would try to segment certain products for the marketplace and then segment another set of products for their brick and mortar stores. What's your view on whether a brand should follow a strategy like that or not? I mean, listen, to me, again, it comes back to there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to buy something you can buy in store. To be able right. to buy it online you know it's added service to the client if i want to buy something i don't want you to force me to go to a store i right. want to be able to buy it from my house i'm not against i'm not i mean i'm not for that strategy i don't think it's the right strategy i think you know the customer is going to buy it um you want to be able to, to to make it available everywhere now that being said there are some brands which will restrict their product for marketplaces so for example they will sell their new releases on their own site but only second tier or second generation on other marketplaces like eBay, Amazon, just in order to be able to, to keep that traffic uh, on their own website. Now, if you're a known brand, you can do that, right? So if you're Toomey, for example, or you're you know, Microsoft, right. yes, you can do that. But if you're just you know, a store, online store, who's just selling you know, a mix of a product, it's not gonna change anything, right? You don't right. have that luxury to say, okay, I wanna segment you know, my inventory and have the good stuff on my site than the rest on all the other marketplaces. Not going to work. Exactly. Yeah. Great. So maybe just switch gears a little bit and talking about, and I think this would be a good question for you, Farah, just, so what are the different components that a brand should really think about when creating a brand online? You know, how much attention should they put on their listings, you know, on their social media presence? you know, videos out there, like how would they think about the universe? Because there's so much that they can do and how should they prioritize among all of that? Absolutely. I think it starts with looking at what product you're selling and who your target customer is and sort of where they are, whether it's generationally or, um, you know, uh, geographically, whatever the case may be. I think the thing that I look at is in terms of a differentiator, just because there's so much competition now, it's really having a compelling story and a compelling product offering. And then looking at the different places to get exposure online, whether that's through different social media channels, 
partnerships with influencers, having testimonials from clients to sort of build that trust for new customers who might be uh, considering purchasing on your site. So I think those are some of the core components. I think, um, you know, uh, the other things that you can do when you're trying to build your brand online is, is really putting the most, putting the most transparent information possible. So for us, when we create these product listings, we wanna make sure that we have the best images that are representing that item, different views of those images, the best item description possible, um, the sizing and weight expectations for the customer, whether it's for a pair of earrings, whether they're gonna you know, just fit on the lobe or drop down, uh, I think, I think the more information that you can arm a consumer with in terms of setting expectation, the more they're going to be happier um, with their purchase, the more they're going to feel like the brand is really looking out for them and communicating with them and not, you know, um, trying to uh, just have a sale, but it's relationship with that customer. And then I think, you know, um, and it also will help just, uh, just, prevent an unnecessary returns happening because the client doesn't like it. And while we're a returns business and we love returns, we also want to keep items, you know, with happy owners, or if they are unhappy, find new happy owners for those items. But I think it really, when you're looking at building a brand, it starts with the story. It starts with the visual components. It starts with aligning yourself with, like David said, aligning yourself with the kind of uh, buyers and clients and reputation that you want your brand um, sort of in a cohort or peer set with and then and then looking at who your target customers are where they're shopping how they like to be communicated to um, are they more visual do they want to see just uh, a picture of the product do they want to see it in someone's hands or how it looks on someone else do they want uh, you know community uh, peer related pictures. So it's not just a model that's perfect. And you know, the item that they get is going to look completely different when they get that item at home. So I think there's all of these elements that you have to consider um, in terms of, you know, built when you're starting off building a brand and just making sure that you're as uh, you're communicating as much as you can and as transparent as you can to the consumer about, you know, what their expectation should be about what they're getting. Right. I think for happy outcomes. Right. And then how would you take, so you've built your brand, you've, you've under, you, you know, you've, you've figured out what your message is, your customers, et cetera. How would you add to that maybe a more targeted marketing strategy? You know, for example, everyone says that, you know, Amazon is the next big marketing platform, advertisement platform out there competing with Google. Like, should I be thinking about an advertisement strategy on day one? Should I be, should I wait organic for a period of time? Like how would I think about just complementing what I'm doing with a more paid advertisement campaign, paid advertisement campaigns? Yeah, David, do you want to talk about some yeah. of the things that we do on our marketplaces? Yes, I'll take it. So, uh, of course, we, when you start listing on these marketplaces, you know, the fact, the reason why they charge you these fees is because you uh, take advantage of the marketing efforts that those marketplaces do, right? So, if you start selling on eBay, automatically your listing is going to get, you know, some traffic because you're on eBay, you're on a marketplace that gets a lot of visitors. Now you're competing with other sellers. So in order for you to be able to, you know, to, to show up on the listings, of course, you're going to have to spend a little bit of dollars, right? In order to, for your listings to be sponsored and to show. I always recommend when a brand starts, or any business that starts selling online, you have to have a budget in the beginning uh, for advertising, whether it's on the marketplaces, whether it's on Amazon, eBay, whether it's on Google, whether it's pay-per-click, you want to bring that traffic. You want to spend a little bit of money and bring that traffic. And then slowly, slowly, you know, you're, you're spending, your marketing spend is here. And then you evaluate and see, you know, the return, the ROI on your, on your, uh, your marketing campaigns. And then if you're staying within your, your range, then you keep on increasing it. More marketing dollars you spend, more sales. At one point, you're going to hit a plateau. But the good thing about that is it's easy for anybody to start getting traffic right away on their listings, on their website, right? If you just launch a site today, no traffic, no nothing, even if you have the best SEO, you can't market a site. You can't launch a site today and be number one on Google uh, on the search uh, results. It's impossible, right? That used to be possible 10 years, 15 years ago. 
when there was, you know, what we called black hat SEO, when we would trick, you know, people would trick the, the search engines by putting, right. you know, keywords on the listing, you know, in the same color as the page, you wouldn't see them. Today, it doesn't work. Google got smart. They released, you know, all their releases. It doesn't happen. And they actually, Google wants you to spend money. It's funny because the minute they see you spending money, they're like, okay, well, this is a business that we could trust. It's a site. They're spending money. Let's look at the site. And they, uh, they kind of uh, analyze your site differently. So, yeah, you have to spend a little bit of money. Not crazy, right? You can start slow. You can start as low as $50 a day, $10 a day, anything, just to mm -hmm. measure and see how it goes. And then if you see, hey, well, I spend $10, but I'm getting $100. Well, if I spend more, I'm going to get more. Uh, and today, these marketplaces, you know, some people think, that these marketplaces are just doing that in order to get more money from the seller. Yes, maybe, but not really. You're competing with other sellers, right? Amazon is even worse because Amazon, you're not competing with other sellers. You're competing with other sellers and Amazon as well. Because remember, right. Amazon is a seller, right? <laughs> so Amazon sells a product. There's even, you know, everybody says, oh, when Amazon sees that a seller is selling a product, you know, very well, they try to go source it and then sell it themselves, you know, and they, they, they right. modify the algorithm that shows. So, of course, you know, I mean, again, it comes back to the expertise of the company you partner with. And I rather spend more money on one marketplace versus another just because I know that the ROI is going to be better. 100%. And would you, so if you decide that, say, Amazon is your marketplace of choice, let's just assume that that's for the, for the sake of argument, would you double down on Amazon strategies and marketing there? Or would you drive external traffic through Google, through other strategies outside of the platform to the platform? Like, how would you think about segregating the strategies within and outside the platform? I would, and again, it comes with the expertise of the partner, right? right? And, and where, you know, we can tell a client, listen, you're gonna spend, if you're gonna spend, if you wanna spend $1,000 a month on marketing, let us spend it the right way. Uh, right. If there's any value in, you know, spreading that investment or that marketing campaign across different marketplaces, then yeah, we'll do it. But if there's not, there's not, you know, so there's also when you, you advertise on Google, as an example, there's some keywords that are more expensive than others. Think about gold, let's say, or, you know, jewelry or watches. Why? Because you're competing with big brands that are spending top dollars. Same thing with insurance, you know, life insurance, health insurance, some keywords are up to $100 a keyword a click just because, you know. They're competing. So I think it's it's very smart to get the expertise of a company, a third party that that will be able to kind of manage your, your marketing campaign and get you the best traffic and best conversion for the money that you spend. So if, you know, the type of product that you sell, you need to focus 100% on Amazon, then yeah, we'll spend that money on Amazon 100%. But if we know that there's an opportunity on another marketplace to generate the same amount of sales or higher, then you have to spread it. You don't want to put all your eggs on the same basket. Again, you worked at Amazon. We sell on Amazon. Uh, we, you know, we have a lot of sellers on Amazon. The biggest fear with these marketplaces is today you have your store online, tomorrow you don't. They shut you mm -hmm. down whenever they want. Uh, so definitely you don't want to be selling on one marketplace alone because if they shut you down, you're basically out of business uh, overnight, right? So it's also important to, to take that in consideration. Yeah, even related to that is, you know, diversification across marketplaces but also diversification on the supply chain side so for example a lot of a lot of brands will just work with fba or fulfillment by amazon and then you have a situation like COVID hit and they shut a bunch of brands down and then a, a bunch of brands were just stuck you know with fulfillment and so you know there's sort of di diversification on the on the back end as well any any views and thoughts on that and just diversification across front end and the back end i'll be honest with you um you know um, I'm against FBA. I'm not a big fan of FBA. And the reason, like you mentioned, again, is putting your, all your eggs in the same basket. Um, you know, to me today, e-commerce, your inventory needs to be available across all marketplaces, right? So you want to be able, if you want to send your inventory to FBA because you don't have logistics, you don't have supply chain to be able to fulfill these orders, you're better off going with a third party um, uh, partner that will be able to manage your, you know, your, your outbound shipments and returns, because at least you still have that, you know, omni-channel, uh, opportunity. Yes. I know today there's some sellers that are doing FBA. There's another way around. You can go on, you know, on Amazon, you can create, you know, a PO order and have it shipped, uh, you know, to a customer that bought your product on, on Walmart. Think about you, if you're a Walmart fan, 
and you know you love Walmart and you shop only on Walmart and you go on Walmart and you order something and then what do you what do you get home? You get a box with the smile of Amazon. <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> feel right. right, right? It doesn't feel good. Uh, and at the same time, also you're paying, you know, for storage. You're paying for, uh, you know, I, I'm not I'm not a big fan of FBA. I mean, we sell. Listen, we uh, fulfill a minimum fifty thousand individual uh, retail items a week. Right. right, that ship out of all our buildings, and of course, you know, FBA, Amazon has always been after us. Do FBA, do FBA. There's a plus, right? Okay, you can't, you know, you can't also just, you know, uh, be negative. The plus is because you know a lot of people shop Amazon Prime, and the reason for that, if you do FBA, you can participate in in Amazon's Prime. But there's another way also. Amazon has Seller Prime fulfilled, right. so you can yeah. sign up to be Seller Prime fulfilled, fulfilled from your own warehouse or a third party. And your product are still going to be, you know, uh, Amazon Prime. But again, I mean, it depends, you know, what the brand has and how they want to start. Right. Yeah. I mean, people shouldn't forget that this the seller fulfilled Prime option exists now. And you know, if you can meet the SLAs and everything, the Prime you get the Prime badge. And, you know, yeah. why not take advantage yeah. of that? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. good. So switching gears a little bit on just 2020 trends that we're seeing people are saying 10 years of e-commerce has come early what do you well, how are you guys seeing the market what are you seeing is it is this growth going to stay for a period of time is it a hype what's what's your views on just where the market's heading over the next six months 12 12 months i think it's not a hype uh, <laughs> like i said earlier you know on the call uh, consumers got educated on how better and easier it is to shop online not by choice, but not by, by luxury, but by choice. They had no choice. You had to go online to buy something if you wanted something. Obviously, the trends, um, you know, we've had, you know, amazing sales on e-commerce uh, during COVID. Fortunately, you know, we were fortunate to be able to, you know, keep that momentum. And we've seen, you know, the trends have gone crazy. You know, products that were selling close for retail price, you know, refurbished products, you know, that were sold for, you know, um, almost retail price just because, you know, they were out of stock everywhere. The thing is, is that it's interesting because it's easy to see how people switch right away to online e-commerce, to e-commerce sales in order to buy the products that they need. Um, I talk a lot with our customers. I'm, you know, I'm crazy. I'm obsessed with our customers. When I say customers, I'm talking about an end mm -hmm. product. You know, there's not a day in the week where I don't pick up the phone randomly and just call a customer and say, hey, you know, I work with GoTRG, you brought a product from us, I'm just calling you, I want to know how was your experience, what did you like, what did you didn't like, you know, your feedback is important for us to make it better. And for them, it's always, well, it's the ease of purchase, you know, you go online, you want to buy, uh, you know, a laptop, it's easy to go and click reviews, see right away which one is the best, make your choice in stock, delivery date by this date, you know, check out, and then boom, two days later, you have it at your home, you can try it, you know, for 30 days, free returns, no problem. So people realize that it's easy to shop online and it's actually, uh, it actually gives them more time uh, for themselves instead of having to go in malls or having to go to local stores you know, to, to buy. I don't think it's going to change in the next six months. I think, I mean, what we're seeing is you know, the, the numbers are, are, are gearing towards showing that it's going to stay strong, you know, I would say more than six months a year. Because you know what? COVID's not going anywhere for now. Right. right. All, and even if it does, people are always going to be worried that, you know, there's going to be something else. And they also got the taste of buying online. Right. So that's a key point that you just mentioned is a lot of people who didn't buy online before or were new to it or what didn't really double down on it. I think they got a taste of, of the medicine. Right. And, and they like this medicine, you know, yeah. for the first time a package arrived at their front door in two days and you know, and the, the, the baby boomers, that's, that, that was the other conversation I was having with someone else recently around the, uh, the baby boomers who who probably were not the avid online shoppers were forced into it this time. And they realized how seamless the experience could be. So there's well, this new consumer that's probably created as well. Yes, Farah? 
Absolutely. And also just how we started this conversation, right? The, the, the retailers who hadn't had strong digital channels and, and sales opportunities now are starting to look at it, focus on it, invest in it, elevate the consumer buying experience online. And so as that experience becomes more pleasant for the consumer and more seamless, it's just going to make the the market bigger and bigger and as the retailers continue to invest more in building out additional digital you know sales channels and 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 different ways to acquire customers uh digitally they're going to want to continue you know maybe before uh they wanted that foot traffic in the store but as they start putting more resources and dollars in building out a, a better consumer online experience you know, maybe maybe they won't mind as much. Maybe it'll actually be a strategy that they're, um, you know, that that's that's their premier strategy. So. Right. And are there any categories that you're seeing or you predict that will do well versus others? You know, there was this talk a few months back around mm-hmm. essentials versus non-essentials. You know, the fashion sort of industry dying for a period of time only because no one's going out there. Any views on different categories, what what might work, what what might not? Yes, 100%. So, I mean, the hottest categories at the moment are, of course, anything that is related to, you know, work from home. So laptops, tablets, cell phones, you know, any equipment, monitors, you know, keyboards. That's super hot right now. Not only because, you know, there's a high demand, but there's also a low supply because a lot of these, you know, uh, factories are closed. Uh, So that has a lot of demand because of the work from home. Then you have also the gaming, you know the Nintendo Switches, the, you know, Xbox, PlayStations. Why? Because the parents want to keep their kids, you know, amused. So they buy them, you know, Switches just to, to let them play, you know, all day. Then you also have other categories like, you know, pools, outside, you know, outdoor pools, inflatable pools. You have, uh, you know, uh, workout equipment. You know, uh, the week after all the stores sh- started shutting down, Target, Walmart, all these stores were out of free weights and all this good stuff because all the gyms were closed. Now people want, you know, want to continue working out. They needed to find, you know, equipment, uh, online equipment. It's funny because I followed this trend and I was watching on, on eBay. Uh, and some people were selling, you know, sets of free weight uh, for up to 10 times the retail price. And people were buying them just because wow. they had no choice. They didn't care. People were buying them. They're like, you know, it's like, I don't care. I need it. I want it. I'm going to pay. Um, so, you know, there are categories that, you know, of course, had a boom. Um, you know, right when COVID hit, you know, of course, like toilet paper, everybody right. was going crazy over toilet paper. It was a new currency, you know, right. in America. Now, obviously, everybody mm-hmm. realized that, you know, we're not going to run out of toilet paper. We're not going to run out of, you know, of canned food. You know, we have a, a you know, a good uh, right. supply chain system in the U.S. and North mm-hmm. America. So we're fine. So these categories obviously dropped. But you still have some categories that are, you know, that were nobody cared about before, like bikes also, bicycles. That people are buying now online and they keep and they're you know paying the high price and they just want that item you know and yeah go ahead sorry no i just wanted to add something on the on the point before where we said also it was interesting because i read an article a few weeks ago where a lot of customers also like to shop online now not only because of the ease of you know the uh, pricing uh, analysis and all that but also in their mind when you go to a local store um you touch something with your hands, you want to buy something, you don't know who touched it before. That's the right. store can't control, you can't control, you know, uh, society, right? So people go in, they could sneeze on the, on the package, they can, you know, take their mask out, they can touch it with their hands, you don't know where they've been, if they have COVID or not. And in their mind, the mindset is that if you buy something online, it comes from a fulfillment center. And in that fulfillment center, the only people that are in that fulfillment center are the teammates, the employees of that fulfillment center, and they have you know measures to make sure right. that sanitize the packages. So for them, it's like okay, it's safe. I'm not going to risk it. I'm going to buy it, you know, from uh, from uh, an online. At least I know that there's no COVID on my package. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And what about categories that you think will uh, haven't been doing well and are probably predicted not to do well? You know, I, again, like I, to, to go to my uh, my previous example on just you know fashion as a, you know soft lines as a category. What are your thoughts on just categories that might suffer? So fashion obviously uh, got affected, you know, right before right. COVID because nobody, nobody was going out. Right. Uh, now people, you know, restrictions have been lifted. So, you know, people are going out. Fashion's going to come back. You see all the brands now they're starting, you know, with new collections. Right. You know, designers are starting with new collections. Of, of course, they're going to be affected, you know, uh, more than anybody, right? 
I don't think people are going to be spending on fashion the way they were spending before, especially for designers. I've been reading also, uh, you know, designers that have, you know, lost, you know, 80% of their business uh, volume just because people are not buying. So I think those categories are going to get affected. People also now understand that we're at the mercy of any bacteria or virus like this. So you know what? Right. Might as well spend your money on things that you really need versus, you know, something that you're not going to enjoy. Uh, but I mean, there's categories, there's industries also that have been hit really hard with this. You know, I mean, we, again, like I said, we're fortunate because we're an e-commerce business, but there's some businesses out there that have been affected and basically shut down completely, regardless of the category that they sell. Absolutely. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, I know we're running, you know, going up to our hour here. So I wanted to thank you both for, for joining me here today. I really appreciated all your insights and your thoughts. But before we, we uh, end up, uh, just to tell our viewers, our listeners, where can people find you if they want to get some information about, you know, GoTRG, what's the best way to contact you folks? Absolutely. So if they go to www.gotrg.com, our website, they can read more information. We have reports, uh, blogs, white papers, case studies to learn more about the returns industry in general or ways to reach out on our website so you can contact us directly. We're also active on social media, uh, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. So we look forward to uh, you know continuing to raise awareness about not just our company, but the return space in general. Um, and thank you so much for having us on, on your podcast. We're really excited. Of course. Well, thank you, Farah. Thank you, David. Really appreciate all your insights today. And, uh, you know, we'll definitely be talking soon again. Sounds thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity and for the, uh, the podcast. All right. Great. Thank you, everyone. And we will see everyone again on another episode of Master of the Marketplace with Kunal Yar. Through conversations with experts in online retail with years of marketing, compliance, and inventory management experience, we seek to empower our listeners to master the marketplace. Thanks for listening. We hope to see you next time on Master the Marketplace with Etails.